for the second lecture. So in the last lecture, uh, we were discussing about uh, the traveling salesman problem uh, and a specific algorithm for the problem. Okay, I'll just quickly go over this and then look at variants of TSP, which is uh, widely studied, which are widely studied, and then give one more motivation, uh, uh, which again, a simple algorithm giving excellent performance in practice, but uh, not much theoretical explanation using the traditional uh, analysis. Okay. Yeah. So, just to remind the traveling salesman problem or a TSP is uh, so given n cities obtain a minimum cost or minimum weight TSP two or Hamiltonian cycle. minimum weight Hamiltonian cycle. So the general instance will be a graph with edge weights, undirected graph with edge weights. So what you have to do is obtain a permutation of the vertices such that the corresponding Hamiltonian cycle. So naturally any ordering or any sequence of vertices naturally can be treated as a Hamiltonian cycle if the edges are present there, right? I mean, it can be that the graph has no Hamiltonian cycle, but in typically all instances of TSP, we assume that there is at least one Hamiltonian cycle, okay? So the two-opt algorithm is, so let uh, tau be a tour that is an Hamiltonian cycle. So for every pair of edges, EF in tau, see if the corresponding two up step, step So if edges were say, this is x1, x2, and this is uh, f is y1, y2, and in the tour they appear like x1, x2, etc., etc., y1, y2. So then the modified tour will be, I'll just draw in a different color. So you go to x1 to y1, then to x2, then y2, and then proceed as it is. So, <coughs> is that fine? Okay, yeah. Corresponding to, to up step reduces the cost of the two. If S, then update the two. We repeat two until the two stabilizes. That is no more updates are possible. So you might get a tour where if you take any pair of edges, if you look at the two of swap test step or modify the tour by this two of step, it won't decrease the cost of the tool. Okay, so that is going to be our output. So, for output. Okay. Yeah, so like we mentioned yesterday, uh, since TSP is an NP hard problem, you cannot expect uh, this algorithm to be efficient as well as output an optimal tool okay so either so either tau will not be optimal or 
two will be run super polynomial time okay something bigger than polynomial say n to the log n or whatever or two power n whatever okay <clears throat> So a couple of things. Okay, so in the literature, so when we, uh, so when people introduced two up, so I think this original two up algorithm was in the 1950s or even earlier. Okay, so 1940s maybe. Okay, so so later on, I mean, uh, people who want to use these, they have. So there are lots of unspecified things here. Okay, so when we say for every pair, so how do you choose pair? Does it really affect the performance of the algorithm and so on. So there are such heuristics which have been employed. So like I had mentioned yesterday, so there is also a general k-opt step. So where k is the number of edges. So instead of taking a pair of edges, you take k edges and then look at all possible updations or swap steps so that you can update the tour and see if any of them, how many updates are there all possible roughly k factorial right Ro locally you reorder them may not be all of them are feasible but still uh, yeah depending on the actual order of the edges so yeah in the worst case k factorial total ordering you try all of them so assuming k is a constant this k factorial is not a big deal uh, see if any of them reduces the tour cost if yes then update okay and keep on doing this until we get a stable tour, that is a tour where no further updates are possible. Yeah, so like I had mentioned yesterday, uh, this is an immensely popular algorithm, okay? And the versatility of this is, uh, it's not just TSP. See, TSP is a very specific kind of problem, uh, but there are variants of TSP or generalizations of TSP which are practically very useful well tsp itself is practically very useful i mean that is why you'll see a huge literature on this problem uh, but there are so I'll, I'll mention say for example the vehicle routing problem it's a generalization of tsp okay so where you allow not exactly hamiltonian cycle something like all area tour with a single city okay so you are, you can go and come back to the city multiple times um, but visiting every <coughs> city exactly once, except the source city or the start city. Okay, so there are uh, other variants, multiple vehicle uh, routing and so on. Okay, so yeah, all of this. So the nice feature about this algorithm is this algorithm can be applied to all of this. Okay, so these are called the local improvement heuristics. Okay, or local search heuristics. So in general, these are referred to as local improvement heuristics. Okay. So, yeah. The question is now, well, in the worst case, we know that it cannot be good. The algorithm cannot be good. Either it is slow or it won't give optimal output okay so there has been work on like okay what is the worst case behavior and so on so in the 90s uh what is known is so one uh two up so there are input instances infinitely many where two opt runs for something like two power omega n many steps many iterations similarly for the output yeah, so for the output, we need to make some assumptions. Okay, so how good the output is, how bad, or how bad the output is. Okay, so the, yeah, so I'll maybe I'll describe that first. Okay, 
yeah so for the output the unfortunate thing is if you just assume a general graph okay in fact we can show that if you take any algorithm yeah so say polynomial time algorithm in particular yeah it cannot output a tour which is better than a polynomial factor away from the uh, actual value what do i mean mean by that so let's say c is the cost of the tour which is output okay and say alpha is the optimal value so now if i take this ratio c by alpha see if c were optimal so c is also an optimal tour then c by alpha will be 1 right yeah but otherwise in general you cannot have a tour smaller than alpha right because alpha is the best possible so this is always going to be greater than 1 or greater or equal to 1 it could be equal to 1 as well now we call this as an approximation ratio okay so the closer to 1 this ratio is the better the quality of output or the better the algorithm is that's what how we measure okay so what is known is any polynomial time bound algorithm will have for a general tsp c by alpha so quality of output uh, any so yeah general tsp when i say general tsp there is no restriction on how the cities are connected okay yeah so we, basically we are given a graph and with some weights and there is no condition on weights as well i mean we'll, we can assume that it is positive okay so there is no zero distance cities or uh, no negative distance okay for simplicity so for uh, any general tsp there is no n to the order one factor approximation algorithm Well, when we say there is no, it's not unconditional unless something happens, unless p is equal to n. Okay. So this is the standard narration in all of the algorithms courses. Okay. So whenever we prove some impossibility result, most of the cases there will be a condition. A condition will be some. You can just imagine something unexpected happens. Okay. Which is p is becoming equal to n p. Whatever, if you are not familiar, what is P and P does not really matter. Okay. Yeah. So this is known. This is fairly simple too. Maybe uh, later on I'll just tell you how uh, this can be done using a fairly simple modification. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So because of, so this in fact was also extended to the case of to opt. Okay. So this extends to This is again due to Chandra et al. I'll share the reference for those who are interested in reading it. But uh, yeah, we'll not go into the details. These are not relevant for us. Okay. So see, here the only thing is when I say uh, no n to the order one factor approximation algorithm, I meant polynomial time. But unfortunately, uh, two optics or good thing is two optics not a polynomial time algorithm. So hence, there could be a hope, right? Maybe we can have a better approximation. But this was ruled out by uh, Chandra et al, where again they constructed a series of graphs or an infinite sequence of graphs where if you do a polynomial factor approximation, say n to the 3 or n to the 5 or n to the 100 factor approximation, then they can answer the p equal to np question. In fact, they can show that p is equal to np. Okay. So, yeah, under this assumption, so this algorithm is. Pathetic. This is really not anything new because we already know that uh, TSP is NP hard. So hence, one of the possibilities ruled out. But what uh, Chandra et al did is both the possibilities are ruled out. So not only that there's exponential time, so the instances where the algorithm runs for exponential time, but also that there are instances where this algorithm is really bad. That's the quality of output is bad. Okay. Yeah. So this calls for so this calls for restrictions of TSP, okay? So which are again widely widely popular, okay? So see, after all, we are talking about cities, right? 
so we can have some geometric properties okay so once one of the usual uh, special case is that of euclidean tsp okay so the most elementary case will be assume that the cities are points cities are points in in a plane and distance standard euclidean distance So let's take uh, this case. Yeah. So now, so these are the cities: one, two, three, four, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So between any pair, the distance is the standard Euclidean distance. Okay. So say if I have two points, P is x1 y1 q is x2 y2 distance between p q is what is that what is euclidean distance x1 minus x2 square plus y1 minus y2 square the whole square root okay so the standard euclidean distance so this again is an oversimplification in the sense that uh, uh, See, in real world, right, if you have, say, a set of n cities, there may not be a road between every pair, okay? So you may have to say, if I, if I want, so these could be real cities and there may not be a direct road from 2 to 4. You may have to either go through 3 or 5, okay? But here we'll assume that it is allowed, okay? That's a simplification, so that we can use the metric structure. So this basically gives you a metric. So this distance, the Euclidean distance, is called a metric. It has properties of a metric. Okay. So, so the what are what are the properties? So distance between. So if I measure the distance between P to P, it is zero. And distance between P Q is less than or equal to. If I go from P to say some W and then from W Q. So this is called triangle inequality. Okay. Yeah, so this is a nice thing about uh, Euclidean distance. There are also other metric distances. So in general, so people consider metric TSP where the distance satisfies the metric property. So this variant, or the metric variant as well as the Euclidean variants, are widely, widely popular. Okay, both experimentally as well as um, theoretically. Okay, so they have been studied left and right. Particularly, see the general case is really disappointing. Okay, I mean if you can't even approximate the tour by a polynomial factor unless p equal to n p, uh, people are completely lost interest. And in most of the cases, real world examples, what happens is you can fit in some metric, okay? Not necessarily the Euclidean metric, that is Euclidean distance. This is also called L2 distance or L2 norm. So there are other variants. One is uh, called the Manhattan distance or taxi cab distance. You, you just assume that you basically have a chessboard kind of road structure, okay? So going from A to B, is basically you take the absolute value of difference in the coordinates going through this and this. So you take any route here, right, on this grid, it's going to be the same distance. It's called Manhattan distance or um, taxi cab distance or L1 norm. So there are also studies on higher norms, L2, L3 norm, L4 norm. L3 norm will be you take sum of cubes and take a square root uh, up to sign. I mean, you'll have to change the sign if needed. And uh, L4 norm and so on. In general, LP norm. 
Okay, so people have studied all of these. Yeah, so what is interesting here is uh, in the same article, Chandra et al. showed that the two opt algorithm can be guaranteed to give an output where the C by alpha ratio is order of log n. Okay, so in the same article for Euclidean TSP, I'll just write it as ETSP, C by alpha is at most order of log n. And they also proved that there exist instances, infinitely many, such that C by alpha is at least log n by log log n. Okay. So the, well, it's a good news compared to the general TSP that to opt itself gives much, much better than polynomial factor approximation. In fact, log n factor. But the bad news is there are worst case instances where this approximation is large. Okay. Yeah, so this kind of, I mean, this is not something unexpected as such. But uh, what this tells us is our standard way of analyzing algorithms, that is the worst case analysis, is not good. It does not reflect what is happening in the practical setup or how industries use these algorithms or how, what kind of algorithms industries want, industries or other uh, scientific community where this is applicable. Uh, we need to do something drastically different. Okay. A similar is the case of k-means clustering. Yeah, so can I ask a question? How many of you have not heard of k-means clustering? Hello? You haven't heard of, okay. Yeah, so this is, uh, Again, a very, very, I would say, fairly popular. Okay, these days I think people have improved or people have gone beyond k-means clustering. So this is a very classical problem which is has lots of application in machine learning, for example. Okay, so any of the machine learning courses, they will talk about clustering. Okay, there are instances where k-means is not sufficient. So what you are given is you are given a set of n points. set of n points. It could be in Euclidean domain or any other norm. Typically what is considered as the Euclidean domain, that is in the Euclidean plane or d-dimensional Euclidean plane. Yeah. P1 to Pn. And a value k. Output a partition C1, etc., CK of the points along with centers let's call it as uh, uh, beta 1, etc., beta K such that yeah, so now what you want to know is the distance from a point to its center. So let's say these are the points. So these are the centers. Okay. The K is 3. Now let's say this is the partition. I mean, ideally, partition, if the partition is a nice geometric shape, it's really good. But in general, it need not be necessarily. Okay. Now, uh, if you look at the distance, so for every point, I look at its distance from its center. Now take the sum. So what we want to do is we minimize. So we minimize. Uh, yeah, there is a term for it. I am not able to uh, recollect the term. Okay, such, such that the summation, so i equal to 1 to 
k summation x in ci distance between x and beta is minimized yeah there is also usually some normalization factors and so on i'm just stating the general is it inertia okay i'm not very sure okay so there are some other uh, yeah so these points are called centroids and uh, yeah i'm not very familiar with the terminology I should get familiarized with myself okay yeah so you can just imagine one simple example is the following okay so you have uh, so let's say you have these are mobile phone users and you are, you have mobile towers okay you want to allocate you want to allocate uh, users to tower okay so usually in mobile setup it's going to be dynamic but it's it, it assume that you have a snapshot of it and you want to allocate okay so what you so assuming that the cost of transmission is proportional to the distance it, this is basically you want to achieve okay so you have some fixed number of towers say k okay so you want to basically cluster the input and this is also very common in the data uh setup okay so the massive data whatever okay so machine learning or wherever so where people want to identify or isolate uh features okay or isolate objects with similar features or whatever okay so usually they uh, define the distance something which captures the similarities between feature uh, objects and so on okay so this these have wide application so what i want to describe is a, a simple algorithm to achieve this in a very similar spirit to to opt okay so an iterative local search algorithm what it does is the following so the k means method so yeah you begin with some arbitrary partition okay initialize c1 to ck okay now so set mu i as the mean of c1 ci so what is mean of ci basically you take summation x in ci x 1 by cardinal of ci you look at the coordinates and take the average okay so if the points are like say 1 2 3 4 1 5 say in c1 what i do is i take the average so 1 3 1 so it is 5 so 5 by 3 2 plus 4 plus uh, yeah 2 plus 4 plus 5 so 9 11 so 11 by 3 so this is going to be my mean this is going to be my mean okay yeah so now you take this they're called centroids okay so centroids of these points now what you do is you reallocate okay so readjust the cl clusters So for all x, for all points p, p goes to its nearest center. Okay, so what you do is, say if this was the allocation, okay, so say this was the original partition, this green circles. Now these were the mean, I and mean, this may not be the mean, of course. I mean, in reality, I mean, I'm just uh, yeah representing it. Now what you do is for every point, it checks which is the closest center. It goes to that cluster. So you do that reallocation, okay? And keep on doing this. So repeat, <coughs> repeat one and two until 
no improvement so improvement in what improvement in the target value that is a uh, total distance from uh, points to their respective center cluster center okay so this has to be minimized so you just look at this value so you do the updation and then compute this value if it didn't change from the previous cluster assignment then exit then we are done okay so it's very similar to to opt so you locally update okay so all we did is you have a tentative clustering you can just imagine that there is a tentative clustering this could be some arbitrary partition you don't even have to bother okay what it is you can just draw some vertical lines and then take the corresponding clusters or draw some horizontal lines and so on and uh, then you look at the mean or centroids of each cluster as the center okay then reassess then every person every mobile user looks okay so is this which is the closest to tower to me i'll go and allocate myself there okay and keep on doing this so so once everybody does we get a new set of clusters okay so you compute the mean again then repeat keep on repeating this the nice feature a feature about this is this again a local modification every point so the moment you know the mean every point can just reallocate itself okay and it's again iterative and what is the feature of the end point or the final cluster output the feature is no more such improvement is possible that is the mean so the output clustering will be such a way that the centroid of each cluster is the closest for every member in the or every point in the cluster okay yeah any any questions on the algorithm those who haven't seen see i might be giving the most rudimentary type of k means there are lots of lots of variants and lots of improvements and so on okay so this is the the fundamental or the most rudimentary k means clustering So this algorithm, the status is similar. Status of K means is similar to that of to opt. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's again only in 2000s that people came up with worst case instances where the running time could be as big as 2 power omega n, so 2 power n by 10 or whatever. Okay. And again, um, so the people also came up with examples, worst case examples where the output quality of output will be, so this value, right? So this value will be far from the optimal value by a polynomial factor and so on there are improvements which can give up to i think log n factor or whatever okay but otherwise in general uh, this algorithm is bad from a theoretician's perspective so if you go and talk to an algorithm design person they'll say oh this is bad but if you go to the industry people or even ml people they'll say oh this is nice this is nice this is good so in practice this algorithm again compared to uh, just like to opt algorithm this has been giving algor uh, output fairly fast and the quality of the output in most of the scenarios has been good okay so only thing is i mean the, the more more modern applications i mean people just find out that k means is not sufficient i mean due to there are certain uh, restrictions so i was listening to one of the talks so in particular one uh, bad point about k means is so they will get affected by outliers okay so if you have some points which are far off then k means gets into trouble if you have outliers what will happen is i mean k means will end up allocating centers to these people so then you lose centers right if there are some say five outliers you lose five centers for them okay but the best solution would be just detect outliers and throw them out right so don't do any allocation to them okay so the, yeah so there are such modifications or improvements to k means i mean to get rid of such uh, peculiarities or whatever but otherwise k means has been a wonderful algorithm and has been fairly useful in practice but uh, the traditional algorithm analysis does not explain why it works well okay 
so whenever i talk to a person who works in machine learning or a student who wants to work in machine learning they will talk about k means whatever so I, i i don't really know what is the application there i mean those who have done it would know but i was really surprised that it is fairly widely used yeah so any questions so far okay so yeah you might ask okay are we just going to look at only such iterative algorithms which do local improvement not really but it so happens that many of the useful algorithms have such features okay so this local improvement see uh, at, at least me i personally believe algorithm if it is very simple to implement and most of the cases they also work very well okay so though there is no rule and in fact so for tsp two opt is not the only algorithm i'll give you plenty of algorithms later on which are also very handy and very useful in practice as well they are also fast and their approximation ratio is also good but unfortunately no explanations are given okay so it's not like the community didn't notice it for long okay so community did try to come up with a uh, alternative analysis in the 60s 70s itself okay so one of the uh, earliest which you would have seen in an algorithm course too is average case analysis so let's say uh, a is an algorithm t is a measure okay so the performance of the algorithm the average performance so average whatever average a of n would be you run through all inputs of length n so let's say fn okay so t of x but you take average now okay so you take the summation you multiply it by 1 by size of f okay so fn all inputs of so instead of taking so if you compare uh, what we had in the last lecture so what we had is instead of this summation we had max right max x in fn t of x okay so instead of max what if we take the average now just a minute there was a question i think uh, okay no question okay uh so there are multiple problems with this notion uh what happens is like so in many cases right so for example take uh, the clustering problem we'll be taking n points in an euclidean space right or euclidean plane or similarly for tsp we might have n points from an euclidean plane so once you have euclidean plane the number of inputs of size n that is set of all n points this will become infinite so you cannot do this so this works only if if fn is finite or the cardinality is not infinite okay so yeah in general what people do is like so change the analysis slightly so in general so when fn is not finite 
we just take average case complexity as the expected value okay x is taken uniformly from fn expected value of this okay so you just imagine that a point is given uniformly at random from the set of all possibilities okay that is a configuration that is a set of n points then you look at the performance of the algorithm on that but you take the expectation with respect to that okay so this basically solves this problem of like averaging out okay so particularly when fn is infinite you cannot really do anything okay but this solves the problem right so expectation is defined for over for even for a an uncountable domain okay so the expectation can be defined only thing is i mean the computation of expectation would be different than what we do in the district discrete setting so yeah in fact this has been again fairly fairly popular so one of the first cases that you would have seen is average case complexity of quicksort right many of you might even have seen it so at least you would have read somewhere that average case complexity is n log n whereas worst case complexity is n square okay yeah so first question is okay why is this not useful or why is it good see in a way it should be good right you are looking looking at at an average on an average okay this is good okay fine so for example i mean if i look at two opt if i say okay on an average two opt performs good so in expectation that means if you give some random instance it should perform according to the expectation or close to the expectation similarly for uh, k means clustering too okay yeah while this has been widely studied and this is also something we are going to see towards the end of the course okay so this is in general it's called probabilistic analysis of the algorithm okay so where see now the moment we have expectation so why on earth should i have uh, the uniform distribution why can't i use other distributions so naturally the it it opens a plethora of opportunities there okay so in fact what we are going to see what is known as smooth analysis in fact it can be seen as kind of probabilistic analysis okay where you define your own distribution or you define a distribution which you think is relevant in practice okay so yeah so briefly i'll just uh, tell you why usually average case analysis fails i mean in the sense that it fails to explain practical behavior of algorithm uh, i'll tell you two contexts okay so one is the continuous domain that is the euclidean instances and i'll also tell you um, the discrete domain too okay so yeah so let's just quickly look at i'll just simplify things so let's say we are focusing on etsp or k means in the euclidean domain okay just to simplify things uh yeah i'll also give you an exercise where you can argue it out as well okay so we'll just assume that we'll consider the points taken from the unit whatever square okay so 0 1 uh, 1 0 0 0 0 0 1 1 1 okay so suppose we are given n points so how do you define the uniform distribution you basically sample n points independently uniformly at random okay now the interesting fact is we can prove a lot of properties for such random points i'll give you some example okay so what happens is so for example suppose i take n points okay n is sufficiently large is the process clear to everyone 
what I'm doing is I'm sampling. So uniformly at random, I take the first point. Okay, some random points. Let, let it be just here. I uniformly sample P2, independent of P1. It could be equal to P1 as well. It doesn't matter. Okay. Then P3. So this is P3. This is P4. This is P5. This is P6. This is P7. This is P8. I'll ask you the question. So what is the probability that the shape, right? So if I just draw these points, it will look similar to this. Can somebody tell me what you think would be the probability? I mean, it's not a very well-formed question. I mean, it, it's just an intuitive question. You understood, right? I, I, I mean, when I say shape, something scaled down version of this. That is also similar, right? Something looking like this. This is also a similar shape. So what would be the probability? Yeah, anybody? Any guess? Okay, good. There is one guess. Anyone else? Okay, so let me even simplify it. Okay, so let me even simplify it. So what is the problem? So I draw a line. Okay. So what is the probability that three points, three of these n points will lie on the same line? That is three points are collinear. Yeah, just a minute, there is a distraction here. Yeah, so Sartak, will your answer change? Okay, so what is the answer then for collinear? It's, it won't change, right? It's the same answer. Okay, yeah, so the point is, so when you take points from an infinite domain, particularly the real domain, so all these events will happen with zero probability, okay? So having three points collinear is going to be zero probability, okay? And similarly, having this shape is also going to be zero probability. So maybe I'll give you insight when we talk about probability, why it is actually and so on. But you can just imagine. So what happens is like you go to, go to see, collinear means they're falling in a line, right? So you're sampling from a line, in fact. So what is the probability that you're sampling from this line? Okay. So if you look at this real world, okay, so zero, one, is an un uncountable set. So similar is 0, 1 square. Okay. But if you look at the volume of 0, 1 compared to 0, 1 square, it's going to be 0. Okay. So volume or area covered by a line compared to the square is going to be 0. Okay. So line covers literally 0 volume. So that is why the probability of having such events is going to be 0. So because of this, what happens is we can prove certain properties of a random point. They satisfy certain point uh, properties with very high probability. Particularly, what I can argue is if I take n points uh, uniformly at random, then the PSP tour value will be close to c times square root n. Or I can predict what is that, what is the tour value. Okay. So if I just say, okay, tour value is root n, I will be only away from a constant factor. Okay. So such peculiar things happen when you take random instances, okay? So similar is the scenario when you take uh, the discrete setting, okay? Yeah, so like I said, I didn't give you any explanation. Don't worry if you don't understand anything. You just need to know that this is what happens, okay? So th because of this, average case becomes kind of useless in the practical scenario. So what will happen is, so just imagine, no? So for example, the clustering or uh, if you look at... Uh, not clustering the TSP instance, okay? So suppose you just look at the perspective of one salesperson, Amazon salesperson, okay? 
so every day if you look at the set of city uh, set of cities or localities within chennai the localities that he visits or he, he or she visits will it change drastically do you expect it to change drastically so will it really look like a random point no right so siddharth says no i uh, yeah so many people say no so i believe all of you would say no right there is some correlation right so today he might be coming to iit chennai uh, next day maybe going to taramani right but it will be within the locality with, there will be correlation it is not like the so it's not like every day his tour the location where he visits will change drastically there will be some minor changes and that is the situation in real world too in most of the real world applications the data will be correlated it's not like you have uniform distribution every time so the model that you take random points it kills the purpose the model if you take i'm going to average over all input it just kills the purpose because certain cases of inputs may not occur at all okay or in other words what i want to say is in the case of this euclidean instance what is relevant to industry might even look like this right might might fit into a shape of this form or close to a shape of this form which according to this distribution is going to be a zero probability event or a zero measure set if you use the probability term that is which is very unlikely to occur so when we take average case analysis it's not even considered its weight is going to be zero in the expectation as such right i mean technically speaking so yeah so that is why average case analysis really fails while i mean it does give us a lot of insights to the problem and so on that's why i am going to consider it towards end i'm going to do average case analysis of euclidean tsp and so on towards end a bit of it particularly for the techniques and so on but otherwise practically it is useless okay similar is the scenario when you consider a uh, discrete setting so if you consider the random graph model that is an edge is chosen uniformly at random even there it's the same scenario with very high probability the graph will be connected the graph will have certain properties and so on lots of things happen so again it kills the purpose in the sense that industry applications they don't really care i mean it's not about caring i mean it's more like the real world data right they are not uncorrelated they are correlated and that that's in fact the reason why if you see the machine learning area is thriving so much with so many algorithms because the see there has been traditional learning theory okay so the tra traditional learning theory only focused on uniform distributions they can't do go they can't really go beyond so they are not at all applicable so that is why this practical areas thrive so much in the sense that because of this gap between theoretical thinking and the real real world scenarios okay yeah so now the smooth analysis in fact what it does is tries to capture this information so how do we capture correlated data okay so how do we do analysis of correlated data and how do we say that the algorithm is going to be good based on this information okay so i'll introduce the model in the next lecture i hope uh, the motivation is clear to all of you yeah so so tomorrow's lecture i'll do a bit of probability theory and after that i'll introduce the model for uh, smooth analysis okay yeah so thank you